It's Ocean Day here at COP26. I'm here at Nature's Newsroom. I'm Helen Scales, and it is my huge pleasure today to welcome Sylvia Earle. She is, well, we could describe you as perhaps the David Attenborough of the oceans, but maybe that's even not quite nailing just how fantastic it is to have you here. Sylvia, to start with, the oceans, the ocean is vast. The climate is vast. Can you help us wrap our heads around just how important those two things are, especially as we are here talking about the climate and the ocean today? I think all of us had a wake-up call with that first view of Earth from space in 1968, that Earthrise image followed by other images that make it really clear the world is blue. And since then, we have learned more about the ocean and our relationship to it, why, how the ocean affects us and how we are affecting the ocean. The ocean drives climate and weather. The ocean is home for most of life on Earth. We now have accessed the deepest parts of the ocean and know that from the surface to the greatest depths, it's not just rocks and water. It's a living system that makes Earth a habitable place, not just for us, but for life as a whole. It's where most of life on Earth actually is. Now we know. Didn't know that when I was a kid. So that's one thing that's changed. I was going to ask you, you've, you've, you have this extraordinary career behind you of, of getting to know our ocean. What are the changes you've seen in that time? I've been privileged to spend thousands of hours under the ocean. I've lived under uh, the ocean in underwater laboratories on 10 different occasions. I have used dozens of little submersibles to go deep within the blue heart of the planet. I want so much to share the view, to know that on my watch, I've seen the decline of many of the big fish, that is like tunas and sharks, down on the order of 90% in some cases, more. Half the coral reefs are gone or are in a state of decline. Even the phytoplankton that generates most of the oxygen in the atmosphere over millions of years, shaping the atmosphere that we take for granted. A decline of maybe as much as 40% since the 1950s. So we're in trouble. Now we can see it. We can feel it. We can measure it. The good news is we can also measure the recovery when we stop the killing. Starting in 1986, we stopped, put a moratorium on the killing of whales. There are more whales today than when I was a child. There are more sea turtles today. And what is the solution to stabilizing the planet with biodiversity loss, with the climate crisis that we're facing? It's to embrace the natural systems on the land and certainly in the ocean as if our lives depend on them. 30% by 2030, it's a great goal. It's not enough, but it's a good starting place. We have to really understand that ocean life is wildlife. The biggest wildlife trade on Earth is what we take and market as seafood. And to see the decline based on the appetite that is really mostly a luxury choice for most people. For some, it's food security. But for most of us, who needs to eat a tuna? I mean, it's a learned behavior, and it's subsidized, that we are subsidizing the large-scale killing, marketing, and consumption of carbon-based units that we call fish, and krill, and shrimp and squid, and octopus, you name it. And at the World Economic Forum in 2020, the International Monetary Fund announced the results of a study that showed that whales today, alive, have a value. I mean, follow the money, follow the money. A trillion, big T, trillion dollars. That's whales alone. If the carbon value of whales can be measured by the economists with you know big dollar signs. Why not the living value of tuna, the living value of squid that we're taking 
you know, millions of tons of these living creatures, smushing them all together with approaches that show no respect, no compassion for what we're doing to life in the ocean. We need to change that. We need a sea change. And I'm pleased to be witnessing, as you asked, what am I seeing? What am I as a witness? Not only the greatest era of learning, also the greatest era of loss, and just the beginning, the reasons for hope, now that we have this superpower of knowing, measuring the change, and understanding that, like COVID-19, our existence is on the line. We have a common threat. When we disrupt the planetary processes that make our existence possible, we better listen up. We better take it seriously. We better do something about it and protect nature as if our lives depend on it. So here we are. We have hope in our hearts and in our minds. We're at COP26. What is your message? What is your hope for what will happen here and beyond COP26? I heard John Kerry, climate spokesperson for the United States, say at the beginning of this conference that we're already succeeding just by coming together because it signals that we understand that we have a problem. You can't solve a problem if you don't know you've got one. So that is cause for hope. And the fact that nature is now being recognized as the driver of climate and the solution. Destruction of nature destroys the systems that make a favorable climate possible. Restoring nature, land, and ocean means cause for hope. And I see a trend, but we really have to hurry. So my, what I hope comes out of this is a, a renewed or a greater, a much greater sense of urgency and a commitment to do what it takes to restore the, the natural world and to really understand that the greatest, most important thing that we extract from the ocean is our existence. Sylvia, thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. Thanks. Thank you.